I'd been tutoring for the Open University for about nine years. It's a very sort of minor academic role, but it gives me a lot of latitude because I work at home all the time, and so I can get involved with all this crazy stuff. My original background is in software engineering, which is a, uh, basically computer programming, but you get involved with design. So I have had to analyse a lot of information very quickly, make sense of it, and come up with a solution. That's what I've had to do in the past. Uh, I also, part of my degree was in physics, uh, and I did a degree in computer science and physics. So, you know, my interest in energy technologies and uh, the physics that goes along with that stems from those times uh, when I did physics at university. I don't have any advanced degrees. Um, I don't know anybody with access to classified information. I don't know anyone in the military. Um, you know, I mean, basically, I don't know anything, so you don't believe what I'm saying. You know, just just check this all out for yourself. Um, what if, pardon? Common sense. Common sense, exactly. You don't know who I am, really. I've told you who I am, but you know, I could be lying. So, check it out. Um, just a note about today. I've got to leave this afternoon, so I'm not going to be. If there, I don't know if there's a panel tonight or not. I'm not going to be on the panel. It's not a conspiracy to keep me quiet. Um, I've got to go back and uh, in, uh, uh, go and sort of look after my family and so on. So that's what I'm doing this afternoon. Um, and I'm going to hopefully go through this. In the councils of government, we must chapter. guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals. So that security and liberty may prosper together. Today, the solitary inventor Tinkering in his shop has been overshadowed by tasks in laboratories and testing fields. In the same fashion, the free university, historically the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discovery, has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research, partly because of the huge costs involved, a government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. For every old blackboard, there are now hundreds of new electronic computers. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. Yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific, technological elite. So, President Eisenhower, 1961, some people say the last great president of the USA. Look at what happened to the president that came after Eisenhower. I think he new stuff. He knew that he wasn't really commander-in-chief. He knew that there was a, another group which was running things. And I suppose the question I'd like to uh, put to you and to, for you to think about is, does the group which has, you know, Eisenhower was essentially referring to reach right into the heart of this very conference? Maybe it does. We're going to, I'm probably going to skip over some things. I've got a lot of material here. Um, I do have this presentation on DVD. Uh, you can watch it on my website, checktheevidence.com. Most of my DVDs are now gone. If you've saw a box of different DVDs here over this weekend, those are the DVDs that I produced, the ones that were one euro, uh, and the booklets for one euro. I made all of those myself with my own fair hands. Um, but I think they've all gone now. But if you do want... DVDs, I'll send them out. There's leaflets downstairs, so take a leaflet, check the evidence.com. I post them out internationally. 
So I, I make all the information available freely as I can, as cheaply as I can, and I give it away if people don't have any money. So, so you, you provide it with orders to, to send it to Yeah, send it to... So it's no need to record them? Not really, it's all pretty much there, you know, yeah. Uh, and we're going to look at some things, I'm um, probably going to skip over some things, because I know these have already been covered by other speakers here. Uh, I put this presentation together about two years ago, most of it. So, um, but what do we need, mean by infinite energy, by free energy? What some people have said about free energy devices. We're going to look at Tesla reproductions, or one Tesla reproduction by a chap called Carl Paulsner. It's a very interesting little YouTube video. Uh, I'll mention Wilhelm Reich who a lot of people talk about Organite and stuff and got people here with Organite stuff, or I think we did on Saturday, and here again today, but they don't talk about Wilhelm Reich that much. Key figure. Um, Dr. Eugene Malov, Stephen E. Jones, Cold Fusion, we're going to mention that. That was in Dr. Wood's presentation yesterday. I'll, I've got a very similar clip, uh, just slightly different, but I want to re-emphasize that because it's hugely important. Um, I'm going to mention John Hutchins experiments. Water-powered vehicles, again, being covered a little bit. Bedini motors. Um, Bruce De Palmer in the end machine. That's a very big one, very important. Uh, we're going to look at the deaths of inventors. And we're going to look at Dr. Stephen Greer and his energy projects. Oh, yes. And uh, we're now, we're, by, the end of, by the time we get to the end, I think it should, make it should be fairly clear to you why we do not have free energy at the moment. And unless where become alert and knowledgeable citizens, as Eisenhower said, when we're not going to get free energy. We have to become alert and knowledgeable about some very uncomfortable things. And I think maybe for some people, uh, that process started yesterday afternoon in one of the talks. Free energy is impossible, of course, as we know. There is no such thing as a free lunch, I mean, these common expressions. In other words, I'm using an expression that if you were to go and have a conversation outside this room, these are the sorts of statements which will be made back to you. It breaks the first law of thermodynamics. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Heat and mechanical work have been mutually convertible. If someone had created a free energy device, they'd be a billionaire. That's the common one. We all want free energy. So therefore, it must be you know, the most commercially marketable thing in the universe. So therefore, why haven't we got it? If, if, if you had a, a device that you could run your house on you know, forever for no money, you'd sell, you'd sell a, a million a day until everyone had got one, wouldn't you? So therefore, because we haven't got that situation, free energy doesn't exist. It's a simple question of logic, is it not? Perpetual motion is impossible. And no one has demonstrated a device which produces more energy than is put into it and fed into it in some form. That's what people will say to you. Those are the sorts of things. Oh, really? But as you know, this is not true. Over unity, what's that? You hear that come across this term, over unity. What does it mean? It simply means that you get out more energy than you put in. It comes from when you divide the amount of energy output by the amount of energy input, and you end up with a figure greater than one. In physics and elsewhere, unity is another name for one. It doesn't just mean what people are trying to do to the truth movement. It is confused with perpetual motion because the idea is that when you connect an over-unity device's output to its input, then it will run itself. So that's why people then sort of you know, cross-reference this idea of over-unity and... and, and and perpetual motion machines. Oh, you can't have a perpetual motion machine. But I'm going to start off with some uh, sort of ancient history, really. And this was mentioned, I think, in uh, Maury King's talk. It was a Faraday homopolar generator. Michael Faraday was a fellow of the Royal Society. And he uh, um, died in 1867. He was an English chemist and physicist who studied the magnetic field around a conductor carrying a DC electric current and established the basis for the magnetic field concept in physics. He discovered electromagnetic induction, diamagnetism, and the laws of electrolysis. Electrolysis is the breakdown by electricity of, of uh, a, so a solution or uh, a, a molten substance, substance. Michael Faraday did an experiment on December 26, 1831, in which he co-rotated a magnet uh, with a copper disc 
and measured a current output. And this is a, a you know, sort of a version of this on the bottom here. Um, even though he'd done an experiment, his own law of induction tended to ignore the, the results of this experiment. His own law kind of couldn't explain what was seen in this experiment. Known for 150 years, the operation of the Faraday homopolar generator, whose current generation could not be properly explained, the world then later embraced Faraday's two-piece induction generator, whose drawbacks include mechanical friction and electrical losses, and that eventually became the current electric motor and also the type of generator that we use, and the rest is history. So this homopolar generator was one of these curiosities of physics, which no one had really studied that much. And then, of course, uh, I'm not going to talk that much about Tesla because there's tons and tons of stuff out there about Tesla. Um, One day, man will connect his apparatus to the very wheel work of the universe, and the very forces that motivate the planets in their orbits and cause them to ro rotate will rotate his own machinery. Tesla's experiments showed that there was a radiant energy field present everywhere. It just needed the right equipment to extract this energy, and sometimes you needed to put the energy into a system to make the radiant energy visible. In other words, how do you, the energy is all around us. It's like the you know, simple windmill. You, you, don't, you don't know until you build a windmill that you can extract energy from the wind, but the wind has always been there. It's been there for, you know, since the Earth was formed, or the atmosphere was formed, perhaps, I should rightly say. And Niagara Falls famously used generators which were originally designed by Tesla, and there's this story that when they first hooked these things up, they got this huge sort of back EMF, and it blew out some of the equipment because they just weren't expecting them to work like this. There was some anomalous energy production from within these which they weren't expecting. Now, again, you know, it's, it's a bit one of these expressions. When you start to look into these free energy inventions and so on, and you really start to try and take all the information in, it's, it's like drinking from a fire hose. There is so much stuff out there. Uh, one of the ones that I came across originally in the 1990s in a Channel 4 documentary, which I'm going to play a clip from later on, was James Griggs's hydrosonic pump. And as in common with many other devices, this had high-speed rotating components. And it's basically, you can see here, part of the hydrosonic pump, it's like a flywheel that's got holes drilled into it. And you rotate this flywheel inside a, a drum, an enclosed drum, and the spindle of the flywheel, you, you um, squirt water through it, and then the centripetal force sucks out the water into the gap between the drum and the end of the flywheel, and it has this effect of generating heat. And it's, it, there, there's some effect which goes on, and the pump is then 125% efficient. In other words, you get 25% more heat energy out than the electrical energy which goes into it. And this was taken apart by physicists, and no one believed it, and blah, blah, blah. But it was developed into a commercially available product, one of the few things that's been developed into a commercially available product. I think it's still available, but I've not checked recently. Um, magnetic sink circuit. Uh, Wilbert Smith designed a circuit to extract energy from the Earth's magnetic field. Wilbert Smith, I've got a whole presentation about this guy, a remarkable chap. Very few people have heard of him. Um, and he was a, became the superintendent of radio regulations in Canada. And he got in touch with uh, aliens, basically. Uh, or he didn't call them aliens, he called them boys topside. Very, very compelling, compelling story of Wilbert Smith. Uh, and he, he also touched on free energy um, topics, essentially. And then I think yesterday, one of his presentations on Friday, I think uh, mentioned Schauberger's Repulsine, quite a well-documented documented device, which was funded by the Nazis. Uh, and some say it was developed into the Nazi saucer program. I'm not... I'm not so sure about that myself, but um, some interesting bits and pieces there too. Okay, um, I'm just going to play this clip of Nick Cook, former Jane's Defence Weekly journal journalist. I think it's still not former, he still works for them, I think. Oops, let's see, if, or maybe I'll just clip over this, but uh, skip over this. Um, Nick Cook has described how anti gravity effects and zero point free energy field seem to be interwoven. He's not the first person to do this. He was one of the first people that I heard connect, connect this in the way that he did. And it was very interesting to me because he was a defense journalist. Free energy or anomalous energy effects seem to pop out from devices spinning very quickly or having spinning components at high speed greater typically than speeds like such as 20,000 revolutions per minute. In a typical car engine, you might get up to sort of 13,000 revs in some of these Formula One cars. 
But it's, to see these effects coming out, you need to go a good bit higher than this. And Wilbert Smith did an experiment with a rotating disc at uh, this sort of speed as well. Um, devices using very high voltages, greater than 50,000 volts, you get these effects popping out. Um, using strong magnetic fields, you get effects popping out. And high frequency oscillations or, of electric current or magnetic field, these, you, you get this, these anomalous energy effects coming out of these systems. And there's, there's loads of them, hundreds, thousands. And I'm just going to show you uh, an example here. It's not, this isn't a free energy um, experiment particularly, but it's a reproduction of one of Tesla's experiments. And the point I want to show you is that this is a different type of electricity which is being shown in this experiment. And what we're going to see is essentially a 100 watt bulb held under water being illuminated. Good afternoon. I'm going to show you a few uh, things that Tesla has sent to us. He goes into a bit of a description Out and then there's lectures, a bit of music books, while the experiment Page 134, figure very 19. Loud. You'll see the circuit right here. And also the same circuit can be found in his book, The Innovations in Research and Writings of Nikola Tesla. In this book here, it's found in several places. The one we're going to be demonstrating today will be on uh, figure 183. Also, I have gained some of this information from uh, Jerry Vassilato's book, Lost Science, and his other book, Secrets of Cold War Technology. Both are invaluable. Uh, here you'll see my, my setup. It's two copper rods connected across the top with another copper rod that is on a slideable scale. I can slide it up and down. I have lowered it from the higher position today just so you can uh, see it on the film. My camera is not quite tall enough to catch the whole, whole thing. But it's uh, slides up and down. It's just two parallel bars of copper. At the bottom of there is capacitors, just like he says in his book, and the spark up in the front here, powered by a 10,000 volt transformer at the back. And uh, I'll be connecting light bulbs across the bars on these two slidable points, both of which are independently slidable. All, all light bulbs are 110 volt bulbs. The uh, only little bulb will be this bulb right here, which is a 12 volt light bulb. That's for out of a sort of an automobile type bulb. And this fluorescent tube here, uh, I don't think it has a voltage reading on it. And uh, we also have this big fluorescent tube over here. So I'll turn the machine on now. Arc is quite loud, so I won't be talking during this part of the demonstration. It could, the bottom of this video appears to have been cut off because it's a, uh, the aspect ratio of the screen is wrong, so you can't see the spark gap at the bottom. Just below uh, this bottom thing, there's a, another spark going. You've seen some. I mean, the, what this is very similar to what the chap downstairs has got with his experiment. But he doesn't do the underwater bit, which is coming up in a minute. So you can go and have a go with this downstairs if you haven't already had a go with it. Something like it's very similar to this.
this is this is regular electricity. This is some other type of energy that we're dealing with. Looks looks like electricity, but it isn't. Not in the not in the normal sense, or what we we would consider normal. Experiments uh, probably over a hundred years old. So, if that's what you can do, you know, just on your bench top. What can the military industrial complex do? Is that video available? I believe so, yeah. Carl Paulsness is, I think if you Google that name, um, it was there last time I looked, which was a while ago. There's a few people have done similar things. You'll find similar reproductions. They've gone back to orig Tesla's original notes and reproduced exactly how he described building the experiment. And Carl Paulsness is one of those. He's, you know, he's got quite a bit of copper there, and that's quite expensive, so you're probably looking at a couple of hundred bucks for, just for the copper in that rig that he had. Uh, Euro, oh, euros, I should say euros, shouldn't I? Correct, correct. Yeah, exactly. Right, so I want to touch on Wilhelm Reich. He doesn't seem to get an awful lot of air time, and I'll mention, it, I'll, get, I'll mention him again in a bit. He discovered a form of energy called orgone. It seems to be the energy from which everything else is made. So, again, is it another form of etheric energy, zero-point energy, vacuum energy? It undergoes all the, has all these different names but it appears to be something underlying the fabric of our reality. Reich also studied this in relation to human sexuality. That's where he got into it. This is quite an unusual thing that not many people seem to mention because he works as an assistant to Sigmund Freud. And um, that's where he came across this idea that, that some interaction between humans in their relationships, there was this energy, and he called it orgone energy. Um, and he constructed and conducted experiments with what are called orgone accumulators. And that was eventually his downfall, actually. Um, and Dr. Eugene Mallow believed that current physics, based on quantum mechanics and relativity, is almost completely wrong. And he became interested in Wilhelm Reich's work following his examination of working orgone accumulators. That's what Mallow he became very interested in Reich. Prior to that, he had no interest. I think I've got a clip of him describing this. Uh, and Malov started to work in the early 1990s to develop cold fusion and other free energy technologies for general use because Malov's story, it's you're worth getting his book, Fire From Ice. If you can get a hold of a copy of that, it, that will give you the whole, you know, the whole full Monty on this. He basically realized that the university that he worked for was committing science fraud in an attempt to debunk cold fusion. And so he left and thought, right, cold fusion's real, or low energy nuclear reactions, as it should be called. And, um, I, you know, he needed to get it developed. So he, had to he took it upon himself to do it, because he knew the universities weren't going to do it. Um, and he worked for, uh, he had a science doctorate in environmental sciences from Harvard. Uh, he worked for high technology engineering companies such as Hughes Research Labs. Um, and MIT Lincoln Laboratory, which I believe is where Thomas Townsend Brown was as well. Uh, and he was the chief science writer at MIT News Office when cold fusion erupted. And I've got a clip of him mentioning that, I think. I've got a couple of clips of Malov. Um, so this is him talking about orgone accumulators. I'll just let him speak, and you can look at the picture and read the text at your own pace. Wilhelm Reich, a brilliant man that he was, an unusual man, because remember, he did come out of a sexual uh, uh, psychiatric orientation, right? With yes. With Sigmund Freud. So who is something, some person like that to say anything about physics? Right. Well, <laughs> in 1941, brilliant fellow that he was, he brought some interesting observations uh, to Einstein. He actually had four and a half hours with Einstein. By the way, this meeting is virtually... Uh, absent from all accounts of the biography of Einstein. Why? 
because, because of what happened, Rice right? was later uh, disparaged. He died in prison, remember? Yeah, okay. He turned into, just like cold fusion, an insane uh, pathological man. Do you think Einstein took some ideas from him? No, no, not at all. Okay. Einstein, uh, he asked Professor Einstein, a colleague, of course, uh, in, in the fight against fascism. Remember, this was early 1941, before the United States got into the war. Right. But, okay. Of course, both of them were opposed to the Nazis, obviously. And... Um, and well aware of what and was well going. aware of of the possibility. So Einstein, to his credit, felt that all possibilities should be explored in the possible quest to find ways to deal with uh, perhaps war technology and what have you. Uh, uh, you know, his letter later on to President Roosevelt obviously helped the Manhattan Project get going. Mm -hmm. But here was Reich showing him a simple experiment whereby a mercury thermometer, very accurate mercury thermometer on the surface of what we call a Faraday cage, a uh, steel enclosure, uh, was higher and remained higher throughout the day than a similar mercury thermometer in suspended in air. Okay, now this sounds, you'll, you'll, your listeners even who don't know about this may say, well, that sounds crazy. What, what, what could that possibly show? <laughs> well, careful experiments by Dr. Paolo and Alexandra Correa in Canada confirming this uh, type of experiment, and in fact, giving it an even worse bias against being seen. In other words, not having the orgone accumulating uh, layers of material around the Faraday cage. Just using bare steel ca steel boxes, so to speak, uh, in their laboratory, they have found persisting, round-the-clock, elevated temperatures on the metal Faraday cage, even in a darkened room. Now, when I first heard, saw their ether motors and their PAGD, okay, I was obviously motivated to go back and study Reich. Pre prior to that, I had no interest in Reich. But I wondered, well, God, I mean, could Einstein have missed in 1941 a profound discovery? And the answer is absolutely yes. Yep. And we, we cover this in our issue 37. Uh, he brought it to Einstein. Einstein confirmed, I repeat, confirmed, that there was a three-tenths of a degree or more elevation on the Faraday cage. But his assistant, Einstein's assistant, Leopold Infeld, uh, poo-pooed it. He did some half-baked experiments to suggest that, oh, yes, it's a simple ex explanation as to why this elevated temperature mm -hmm. is there. And he pu pushed Einstein away from thinking about it and thus broke the connection, the critical connection, between Einstein and Reich, which if it had persisted, and if Einstein had behaved himself and continued the correspondence, Reich, uh, can, uh, Reich did write many letters, technical letters, to Einstein, pleading with him to reevaluate the assertions, the glib assertions of Leopold Infeld. So Reich knew Einstein... He was right, you know, they were right up there with the top minds of the day. He was right up there with the top minds of the day. Now, all of Reich's books were burned. The only scientists whose books were burned by the people in the USA. And any mention of orgone had been expunged from the literature, according to what I've read. So Reich is one of the key figures. And obviously, just to mention a little bit, uh, about the cloudbusters, for example, Reich developed cloudbusters, which a lot of people who've looked at chemtrails have become familiar with. So there's various areas, and I could say the organite, which accumulates orgone energy, can have health benefits. And Reich essentially proved that, essentially proved that by treating people, and people came back to him because they're having beneficial effects. But again, Reich is somebody that's worth looking into and reading up on if you haven't already done that. And then, of course, we come to this man. Um, and uh, I'll basically got another audio clip here. Of, this is me uh, and John Hutchinson when I spoke to him in 2008. Uh, and there's a whole story behind that. I've got a whole DVD about the, that interview from 2008 with Dr. Judy. Um, so I'll just play this clip. You've obviously been playing with this for a long time. Um, and I know you've been uh, through the wars, you know, at various times with uh, having your equipment confiscated and, and things like this. Uh, I mean, that, that I believe that's happened at least twice. Is that correct? Mm, no, main, main time was 1990 when I was in Europe. It was the Canadian government that took the entire laboratory and tried to make a secret 
operation, but the newspapers found out about it and published the, uh, the news. Okay. And, yeah, that was... Um, but I've been raided before in okay. 2000. Okay. And uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, we wanted to just check with you that I believe it was in 1983 there was a, a person called uh, John Alexander, Colonel John Alexander, in fact, who'd come to see you because he'd learned about what you were doing. I wondered if you could sort of mention a little bit about that. Oh, yes. John Ale Colonel John Alexander was um, 1983. He came with a team from Los Alamos, and he said to me that um, we're expecting a threat from, as I recall it, a threat from the Soviet Union. Okay. And that was a concern for the, the American government. So I, I gave a demonstration for about um, four months working with the team. And unfortunately, the, there were some effects that happened, and sometimes it didn't. It seemed like the equipment was sabotaged, and I learned from yet another c lieutenant colonel that um, a fellow by the name of Bob sabotaged the entire project. So John Alexander was a little upset over that, and he brought in another team from McDonnell Doug Douglas to do a clear, um, not classified report, which I still have that report. And then after that, of course, uh, the Canadian government did their experiments and kept it um, a matter of national security. Of course. Now, I think that's, you know, r really interesting that we, you know, we do know that people in the military uh, are well aware of what you've been doing. You know, it's not as if you have been, uh, you know, working mm -hmm. away uh, totally as like a hermit. They're fully aware of what you've been doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and we understand one of the key things is that in many cases, when you start your experiments, uh, you can switch off the power and the effect that you're generating will continue. Well, we're trying to do a um, parallel here, I believe. And in, when I switch off the equipment, sometimes there's metal samples that have been analyzed by the Max Planck Institute that um, seem to be accelerated in time, ahead in time. Wow. And the crystalline structures are always changing very fast, and the magnetic properties are changing extremely fast. So this is in regards to um, when I basically shut down the power, these samples, which are many of them, tend to alter. Right. Ongoing. The yeah. energy in the equipment has been measured at 100 to 400 watts. And when I was giving a demonstration for um, main news, the newscaster accidentally chopped the extension cord in half by accident and shut down the entire lab. So that's wow. around 400 watts, the lowest power. And if I'm using more modern equipment, it, of course, I'm up to maybe a thousand watts energy to drive the systems and that. The mayor of this city came here and he's a couple of years ago, talking with me, a friendly fellow, Mayor Wright of New Westminster, and he was talking about um, he's giving reports of concrete cracking up, as well as citizens in distress. And it seems when I do an experiment like I did for National Geographic TV and film, I blew out the elevator, so they couldn't get their equipment down after the experiment. And just recently, uh, for Fox TV, I was doing an experiment, and then uh, some plumbing exploded downstairs but I, I take in consideration too that when I was doing the McDonnell Douglas experiments we had a, a water main explode in the, out in the street so that's written up in some of the, the text so I've been through a lot of mischief I think one point I wanted to just uh, dwell on for a second is that uh, w you know we Judy and I we we watched the inter the internet forums quite closely and there are quite a number of people who are saying you know Oh, John Hutchison can't reproduce the effects which he's, you know, makes. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder, you know, what your response would that to, would be. I almost feel silly asking the question, but, uh, I you think know. they, they, honestly, I think they don't listen to radio or watch TV or read books because I've been doing this quite regularly uh, for Fox TV in 2000 and onward up for Griffin Productions as well as National Geographic TV and Film. And... Onward, with many, many different crews have come and gone out of here, and I can sit down, turn everything on, and guarantee an effect within five minutes. So whatever they're reading is maybe so old that they just don't bother researching. That's what I feel. Um, 
As you saw in Dr. Judy's presentation, if you were here, there is a very definite connection between what happened on 9-11 and what happened with John Hutchison's, in, in John Hutchison's experiments. And again, it's to do with this underlying energy, some type of zero-point energy, some type of energy which is fundamental to the structure of matter. And since 1979, John has been doing experiments trying to initially to reproduce the work of Nikola Tesla. And he was using what are called electrostatic fields, which is the with a, a static field is like when you take off a nylon jumper or you stroke a cat and you get this electrical charge building up. That's a electrostatics. And you inter he interacts that with magnetic fields and microwaves from microwave generators and from RF generators, radio frequency generators. He uses these in various combinations, various frequencies, various cycles, cycles them up and down. And when he starts to do this in the region of interference, he produces effects such as the jellification of metal, metal turning to jelly with almost little or no heat or even cooling down in that process, bending and fracturing of metal, lift, levitation and disintegration. So if samples will fly up in the air, things even have, have disappeared. Transmutation, which is one element changing into another, one metal changing into another, which Dr. Wood touched on in her presentation. Fuming of samples, that it's not necessarily smoke that's coming off. And disappearance, as I said. Fusing of dissimilar materials. Again, you saw this with Dr. Wood's presentation, where you've got this sample of metal and wood melding together, but without heat. So what's going on? Now, I'm going to play, hopefully this clip will play, this clip of uh, Pons and Fleischmann, which is similar to the clip that Dr. Wood um, played in her presentation. And this is hugely important to the history of the energy cover-up, hugely important, because basically, without reading out all the text, this is when the concept of free energy started to really get into the heart of the academic community. And they had, they had to pull out all the stops to stamp out this fire. It became very serious because it lasted for a period of two years. And I became very interested in cold fusion in 1989. In fact, when I got my first internet connection in 1996, it was one of the first things I did research on. That and the UFO issue is what I did start to do research on. And it turns out, of course, that these two things are connected, the energy issue and the UFO issue, which I'll get to later. Um, Pons and Fleischmann did an experiment. It was basically, uh, they were chemists, okay, and they did a, an experiment in what's called electrolysis. Electrolysis is a method where you pass electricity through a solution and it breaks down that solution into different compounds, into different elements and so on, and different uh, components. And they found with this particular uh, solution that they used, which was lithium hydroxide and uh, deuterated water, um, that's heavy water, it's got water with extra neutrons in it, extra particles in the nuclei, of the water molecules, they observed that under certain, under certain conditions and at certain times, but it wasn't 100% repeatable, they could maybe put 100 watts of power in, and then when they did measurements, they were getting 200 watts of power out. And then there was all a, big, a, a massive outcry over this, because they were saying that they were detecting uh, elements of a nuclear reaction, Primar primarily, as John Bocris explained in the clip that Dr. Wood showed, and then in the clip that I had, something called tritium. Tritium is only produced in a nuclear reaction. It's, it's, you can't produce tritium in a chemical reaction because of the nature of the material. And tritium is, a, is a, an isotope of hydrogen. It's a hydrogen nucleus, uh, a single, which is a single proton, with two extra neutrons. Right? I know I'm giving you a bit of a lesson in sort of nuclear physics, but it's, it's, it's the only way to explain it, really. Um, and they also got what's called transmutation. So after several years of research into this, and this was primarily done by other people as, well, as later, really, although Pons and Fleischmann, I believe, did get some transmutation, they got, they start off with a palladium electrode, and then they'd find that it had copper in it, and it had zinc in it, embedded in the electrode. Where did this copper and zinc come from? And so this was, this was they, they were said that, you know, the, the, the samples got contaminated, you know, that uh, somebody had actually put in the material to contaminate the sample deliberately. There was fraud and so on. And um, so this, this whole, you know, this raged in the academic community for two years because it looked, there were reproductions. Some universities reproduced it and they were able to get what's called the excess heat. In other words, when you get excess heat, it means you get more energy 
coming out and going in, and this breaks the laws of thermodynamics. And John Bockris in that clip yesterday, if you saw him, he said, we're breaking the laws of physics. And the, because we're chemists, the physicists won't, don't, don't like that. When a chemist comes along and says, we've done fusion in a test tube or in a beaker, they'll say, get lost. You can only do that with a huge, expensive $20 billion project with, which you know, needs plasma physics. It needs a huge, expensive reactor called a tokamak reactor and so forth. You can't do it in a, in a, in a beaker for you know, $200. You, you know, no way. It's just, and I know, because I'm a physicist and I know everything. So you must be wrong. But then you find, for example, somebody like Stephen E. Jones comes along, Stephen E. Thermite Jones, for anyone that's done any 9-11 research, his mate, my mate, Thermite, Marmite, Thermite Jones, <laughs> he comes along and says, ah, actually, folks, and I was describing this to somebody this morning, I've done an experiment with cold fusion as well, and it's called muon catalyzed cold fusion. And I found that, yeah, it's really quite an interesting effect. You, get, you, know, you can get this energy, excess energy, but actually you, can't, you can never use it because my experiment has proved that it, 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 you're never going to be able to get the energy and use it in a machine to drive a generator or something like that. No, my experiments show you can't do that. But what Jones was really saying is, and I was describing this to somebody, like Pons and Fleischmann, they'd say built an electric motor and, uh, and, and got some energy out of it, and Jones would say built a petrol engine and said that his petrol engine didn't work and because his was an engine and theirs was an engine and he could, he, couldn't, he, he could never get energy out of his engine, their engine wouldn't work even though theirs was an electric one and his was a petrol one. It's a totally different, you know, totally different system that Pons and Fleischmann had but yet Jones steps up to the plate, defines himself as an authority and then as Dr. Wood had in her presentation takes this vote, takes this vote on cold fusion. So this went on in the academic community in the 1980s and into the 1990s. And as I say, Dr. Eugene Malov was one of the prime movers in this. And you're going to see what happened to him uh, before too long. And Jones then appears on the 9-11 truth scene in 2006. Uh, sorry, in 2005, just after the NIST technical reports about the destruction of the World Trade Center had come out. So that's when, and when somebody sent me a link that this Jones character was involved in cold fusion, which I wasn't aware of until 2006, then we knew, and this is one of the central things, I think it should be one of the central things of this whole conference, that the 9-11 issue and the energy issue are deeply connected. And somebody here was arguing, I think, that, oh, it doesn't really matter, we know that the Al-Qaeda story is not true, so that's what we need to agree on. No, that's not, that's not the key issue. The key issue is to understand that 9-11 was a free energy, a demonstration of free energy technology. Water itself is quite a mysterious and powerful substance. Given enough time, it can erode steel and rock. It is composed of hydrogen and oxygen two of the most reactive elements on Earth. Science has also known for over 200 years how to extract hydrogen and oxygen gas from water through the process of electrolysis. It was from this field of electrochemistry and not nuclear physics that there emerged a revolutionary idea of a new kind of fire from water. In the 1980s, Fleischmann and Pons used their own money to conduct experiments for five years. They passed a current through an electrochemical cell containing heavy water, or deuterium oxide. One of the electrodes, the negatively charged cathode, was made of the precious metal palladium. The electrical current separated individual deuterium nuclei, or deuterons, from the heavy water and forced them to pack tightly into the palladium cathode. What happened next inside the palladium at the atomic level remains a mystery and became the subject of intense debate. Whether it was actual nuclear fusion or some other as yet unknown phenomenon, the result produced far more excess heat energy than any known chemical reaction. Why is such a phenomenon so astonishing? Why did it provoke such outrage in the physics community? 
To most classically trained physicists, the concept of low-level nuclear reactions producing significant heat energy was inconceivable. It was a very unfortunate time to make such an announcement for various re political reasons, really. The situation in the United States, the situation with regard to the program in hot fusion. Um, so uh, that was against it. But uh, also, of course, was the fact that uh, we were not ready to make such an announcement. The criticism of pathological science is one which has quite frequently been leveled at unusual investigations, which admittedly sometimes are at fault. However, there is also the, the situation that people will criticize a field uh, long after they should really have given up. And that is pathological criticism. They just get trapped in a situation. They have made a criticism. They have to maintain that criticism against all the evidence. At Texas A&M, a group led by Professor John Bockrath, who is widely regarded as one of the world's greatest electrochemists, reported finding the hydrogen isotope tritium, a key signature that some unusual nuclear reaction was going on. The, the first thing was this, uh, this, this uh, thing called tritium, which was a, uh, a, a sub-form of hydrogen which should not exist uh, except in extremely tiny quantities. We found that by working these uh, cells of Fleischmann and Pons uh, containing lithium hydroxide and deuterium oxide, that we could produce this tritium in great abundance let's say, at uh, 10,000 times more than it ought to be there, as it were. And um, let, me, let me stress that we couldn't do it every time, but about one result in five, or one result in four, and eventually we worked up to two results out of three, um, we could produce tritium. That was the first thing, and, and in a way it was the first clear proof of the phenomenon. At Texas A&M, Bacchus's group found themselves under attack. Science magazine writer Gary Tobbs wrote a stinging article that insinuated that someone in the group had spiked the samples with tritium. Although unfounded and eventually proved untrue, the allegation effectively dampened Bacchus's remarkable claims. Well, I was 69 years old at that time. I took the attitude, suppose they fire me, right? It doesn't really matter. I had my career. The worst they could do would be to say, go, your tenure is withdrawn. And uh, therefore I wasn't frightened. And I went on saying the truth and publishing what we'd got. And, but finally the university uh, revolted against this. And they set up an inquiry, uh, if they called it rather sinisterly. The accusation was that I had carried out misconduct of research, you see, that I shouldn't have worked on these things. And, they decided that the accusations were totally groundless and they published all this. But then they started all again about six months later and they had another committee. It was this time uh, when my lawyers asked the university what the second inquiry was about. They were told, it's an ad hoc committee. What's that? Um, we have nothing further to tell you. And so this went on for 11 months of uh, constant meetings and inquiries and so on. And I'm quite sure that uh, they were trying to find an excuse to end my tenure, you see. Finally, they came out uh, OK. I mean, they gave me another letter. I'd had the letter of complete exoneration. This time it said that they had uh, spent this 11 months and had found that I had never done anything, the phrase used were, uh, that contravened the rules of procedure of this university or something rather formal and stuffy like that. But I think the main part was that I had done work which was against the paradigm, and that was what they were really upset about. You know, people said that they'd been to other universities and people had laughed at him and said, what the heck are you doing, trying to disprove the laws of nuclear physics? And of course, that's exactly what we were doing, <laughs> and succeeding, you see. Even though positive results were still coming in, the Department of Energy's negative report effectively killed congressional funding in the United States. Fleischmann and Pons later packed their bags and left for France, 
to carry on private research sponsored by the Toyota Corporation. By 1992, we had video recordings of intense energy release. By the summer of 1994, we had demonstrated sustained energy release. That, of course, if you say you want, you wish to make this into a device, required further research. And we were always working on a time frame of trying to get to that point by about the year 2000. And I think that if the resources had been available, we would have got to the year, to the, the, that particular point, probably before the year 2000. But uh, this did not happen. Yet as early as 1992, cold fusion experimenters began reporting unusual appearances of trace amounts of different metals such as copper, silver, chromium, and zinc when examining their spent cells. Rechecking for possible contamination, scientists like Bacchus and Miley confirmed that indeed new metals and isotopes were being formed, transmuted, during the process which produces excess heat. Kevin Wolf made many measurements of tritium. Then he got some even more astonishing results as early as 92, which were these transmutational results, the, the metal forming another metal inside the electrode, you see, which was super, super anti-paradigm. Um, you know, there's that dreadful word alchemy, which we mustn't use, but it, it was a form of that in a way, that it was creating new metals, you see. In Japan, Tadayoshi Omori and Tadehiko Mizuno at Hokkaido University have produced volumes of data under rigorously designed experiments showing the production of metals ranging from iron to platinum and beyond. The Omori cell using a tungsten cathode has consistently produced excess energy along with measurable amounts of transmuted metals. So that's a very quick summary of the story of cold fusion. Yes, it was reproduced many times and has been since those times, but it takes expensive equipment to do it. It's not something you can do in your garden shed. It's not a 100% reliable, reliable process, but it does work. And you think if you could transmute one metal into another, what if they really can turn lead into gold in large quantities? And as I say, we've got uh, Stephen E. Jones talking about cold fusion. Since Pons and Fleischmann were both well aware of the pitfalls of premature publicity, why would they bypass the accepted conventions of the peer review system and announce their discovery through the media? I was thinking, these guys are not, no fool. They know what they're doing. These are good scientists. Prior to the 1989 announcement, Stephen E. Jones, a physics professor at nearby Brigham Young University, learned of Pons and Fleischmann's work through an informant at the DOE. In a flagrant example of shameless opportunism, Jones insisted on going public quickly with his comparatively much less clear results. Disparaging the excess heat claims of Fleischmann and Pons, Jones' announcement would have effectively prevented the two scientists from patenting their process, a process they had developed on their own over long years of research. Is it a short... So so Jones was essentially responsible for killing cold fusion. He's one of the main people. It wasn't just him. So he has been responsible, for example. I, I posted an article when F Fukushima happened last year. We don't need nuclear energy. This can be developed into a source of energy. And I would contend that black projects have got this energy or something like this. And somebody like Stephen E. Jones, he's essentially at least partly responsible for things like Fukushima happening. So just think about that. Is it a shortcut to fusion energy? I don't want to disappoint anyone. I think I'll put my read my lips answer here, and then uh, and then I'll carry on. <laughs> I think that'll become clear why I'm saying that. Can you read my lips on that back in the back? It says it says no. Energy is a long way off. That's why I say no. This is our result. Way off. That's why I say no. This is our result. Way off. That's why I say no. This is our result. Way off. That's why I say no. This is our result. Uh. So he said you couldn't get energy from cold fusion. And everyone then went along with his statement. 
He herded everyone. And that's exactly what he did with the 9-11 Truth Movement starting in 2006. And I, I was one of the sheep in that herd at that time. And I've written about that in my book, 9-11, Finding the Truth. So it seems the whole affair of stage fusion was stage managed from start to finish. They knew early on that they were going to need to manage it should it come out into the wider arena. The goal was to trash and debunk the science. And you can see this if you read Dr. Eugene Malov's book, Fire from Ice. You can see the pattern emerging in that book. And it seems that a whole array of skeptics and debunkers were wheeled out to stomp out the fire. It was for the first time the phrase pathological science was brought into general use. And I've, I, I spoke to somebody a few months ago, oh, cold fusion has never been reproduced. What he really meant was, I'm not aware of any reproductions. There are hundreds of reproductions, you can go and look them up in the scientific literature. And I put some booklets on the table yesterday with some information about that. They've all gone now, but you can get them from my website. Uh, please look at the website, checktheevidence.com, or contact me afterwards if you're wanting more information um, and you don't get time to ask me a question or whatever. Please do that. But it's difficult to reliably reproduce cold fusion. And some of these energy experiments have the same problems. It's not easy to make them work reliably. And then to engineer them into a device, that's a whole other issue, which I'll mention a bit later on. But different reproductions of cold fusion, some have just produced the excess heat and less evidence of like neutron emission or neutron activation. Um, some get, do get the evidence of neutrons and not, transmutation is not always seen either. You get various combinations of these things appearing or not appearing. So now we're going to switch to another very important one, which is Bruce De Palmer and the end machine. This is a kind of a derivative of the Homo polar generator, which was I mentioned at the beginning. De Palmer studied electrical engineering at Harvard in, uh, and from 1958 and taught physics at MIT for 15 years, working under Harold Eudine Edgerton, he was also employed by Edwin H. Land of Polaroid, the camera company. He is the brother of Hollywood film director Brian De Palma, who produced that uh, film Carrie, the very scary film with a very shock ending, if you remember it. Uh, it's a very scary film. In his study of inertia, he developed a kind of rotating magnetized gyroscope. That's perhaps what I would call it. It's not, not exactly that, but it's kind of a bit like that. And this he called the end machine. And I've got a clip here. Right now we have the entrenched energy monopolies and cartels. You know, we have OPEC and we have the seven sister oil companies that control all the oil and energy. But what people have to understand is that the people who run the energy business in this world, which is the biggest business on the planet, turning over four to five trillion dollars a year, it's bigger than guns and drugs, it's bigger than defense, they control the newspapers, they control the governments. But these companies are so big that they regulate the government which regulates them. In 1977, Bruce De Palma unveiled the first prototype of the end machine an electrical generator which uses rotating magnets to generate up to five times more power than it takes to drive it. I know about the fact that the Japanese government and the Indian government have ongoing projects to produce end machines for domestic power. Uh, my partner is Paramahamsa Tiwari, who is the director of the Nuclear Power Corporation of India, which operates all the nuclear plants in India. In late 70s, I learned from Bruce de Palma that he had carried out certain crucial experiments by rotating electromagnets. Tiwari tested a prototype based on de Palma's end machine under laboratory conditions. The results were deemed too impressive, causing disbelief and suspicion among conservative government officials and the power consortiums that backed the project. Tuari was forced to abandon the project completely. One of the pivotal people that uh, I encountered early in my uh, career was Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut. Lift off. Lift off. Edgar J. Mitchell, an Apollo mission astronaut, founded the Neuretics Institute in Southern California. The Institute's charter was supposedly to develop alternative energy systems by attracting inventors from all over the country. Mitchell became extremely interested in De Palma's end machine. He made De Palma a paltry offer to buy out the invention which De Palma naturally refused. He said to me that uh, if I ever tried anything on my own in California, I would get my head blown off. So I was scared to death. 
The CIA operates through various very innocent looking uh, fronts to find out what people are thinking and, and what they're inventing. Now, what's more innocent than a benign institute founded on transcendental prim principles to help new age inventors bring free energy into the world? And that situation still exists in the United States today where person really understands what's going on just can't get their idea out because the alternative science and medical fields have been co-opted by the intelligence services and he converted this little engine to run on water this is many many years ago and he used it for several years and somehow the news got out and one day he got visitors and he was told to dump the engine or else three weeks later the man was dead and the coroner's finding was that he fell off the back of a train. He was drunk. Now it happened that he didn't drink. There is no progressive science in a world where every scientific uh, idea is evaluated for its military potential. Power, or energy, and control of energy equals power in the new world order that is emerging. If you control the energy, the way we get around, the way we get electricity, the way we have our TVs and video cameras and stuff. If you do the control of the energy, then you've got control of the people. That clip actually pretty much covered all of it. Control the energy, control the people. And as Bruce De Palma said, and we're going to come back to this, what, what about setting up a group based on transcendental principles to bring free energy to the world? We're going to come back to that. So, Bruce De Palma himself, I mean, the, he, he does have a website, and I'd suggest you go and read it, brucedepalma.com, and there's some very interesting emails and stuff that you can download between him and Adam Trombley, I'm going to mention in a minute, about this whole business with the end machine. Now, if you go and read various web pages about the end machine, you'll come up with some interesting things. For example, um, yeah, Bruce De Palma died in, uh, 90, I think it was 1997, which again I'll mention a bit later. But this was not a surprise, his death, considering the condition I had seen Bruce in when I visited him in December 1993. Bruce began each day upon arising sometime before noon with fine wine mixed with sparkling water. Years of alcohol and substance abuse finally took its toll. The mystique and the enigma that encircled the life of Bruce De Palma was due in part to the fact that he was never able to prove his theories with a working over unity device. Oh, really? Oh, really? So why on earth would Edgar Mitchell go to him and say, if you go around doing this in Southern California, you're going to get your head blown off? I'm going to increase the pace a bit now, probably, to get through all of this. Here's another one. Not an end machine. Let's have a look at this one. ...to another good idea and imagine a machine that could power your house for free. Well, that's exactly what two Australian inventors claim they've developed. Using magnets and a battery, their new generator has been described as revolutionary and foreign investors are lining up for a piece of the action. Chris Allen reports. So, John, this is the machine? Yes, this is it, Chris. What's it capable of? Well, it'll, it'll power a house. This will, the machine will provide, provide sufficient electricity to run a house and have power to burn. It sounds too good to be true, but inventor John Christie is convinced his machine will change the world. So, John, basically you're saying this machine can produce five times as much power as it consumes? Yes, it, it does. This one, exactly as we see it, it does. And, in fact, it can produce more than that. Once kick-started from a battery, John and his partner Lou Britz say this prototype will run for years without stopping generating 24 kilowatts of power a day. You don't get more revolutionary, I think. I mean, we're talking about something that has the capacity to change the way that the world produces its electric power. It has the capacity to change the way that motor cars are, uh, are propelled. You can, you can replace the combustion engine, in fact. John, these are big claims. Are you sure you can live up to them? We don't really need to live up to them, Chris. What, what the... The technology speaks for itself. I mean, a householder could buy one of these machines and install it in his garage and power his house forever without buying another kilowatt from a retailer. I mean, that's how serious it is. Steve Brassington is an independent electrical engineer. He's seen the machine and backs up everything John says. It's revolutionary. That's the only way to describe it. I think the, um, the technology 
it's not bending physics, it's just using principles um, that I guess are, are commonly in use in power generation today in a different way. These guys have thought outside of the square. Basically it's magnetic attraction and magnetic repulsion that provide the movement or the moment of the, of the motor. Can you understand why some scientists are sceptical about it? There is no physicist or, or engineer who has looked at our, our um, motor or has looked at our figures who says it doesn't work. Lou is an electrician and John a businessman in Cairns in far north Queensland. The two unlikely inventors have been tinkering with their machine for six years. They've applied for an international patent and have been swamped by people wanting a piece of the action. The, uh, these are the coils. We mentioned the coils don't get hot. Mm -hmm. Local businessman Alex Roma is one of the many offering money to help develop the generator. If it proves up to, uh, to be uh, what they say it is, it certainly would be something I'd uh, invest in. John has also spoken to millionaire inventor George Lewin, the man who came up with the Triton workbench and who's now setting up a fund to stop Australian inventions going overseas. There's an opportunity here, I think, to share an invention with the world um, that is beyond anything that we've ever contemplated before. Scientists here at the local university say while they're interested in John's machine, they're also cautious. They say if the machine can generate as much power as John says it can, then they will have to rewrite some of the laws of physics. And they've urged people to be cautious about investing in it until the generator has been independently tested. Anybody who says it doesn't work hasn't seen it or haven't, hasn't looked at our figures, they haven't reviewed it. If they look at it, they'll all agree with us that it does work. John says the household generator should be available in a year and sell for about $5,000. If he's right, it will make him much more. And how much do you think of technology could be worth? I have absolutely no idea. We could be talking about millions of dollars here? Yes, oh, oh, very definitely talking millions of dollars, but uh, I, uh, I'd hesitate to even take a, a stab at it. Mm, good idea. <laughs> good idea, yeah. What a good idea to be able to run your house without burning any fuel to run the world without, you know, mining and drilling. Well, if you go and look at that device, lutech.com.au, when I put this presentation together two years ago, I've changed it a little bit, that website was still active, saying under construction. lutech.com.au now no longer is a website. So a quick mention of Adam Trombley's uh, closed path homopolar generator. This was actually quite similar to the end machine. And um, again, it's something that you can look at. Uh, let's see. He, th thus, I'm going to read out what uh, Bruce De Palma wrote about the Trombley device. Thus, the, although Adam Trombley, the senior designer of the machine, has received two written gag orders from the Pentagon Department of Defense forbidding him to reveal the details of the machine upon threat of 10 years imprisonment, for violating security relating to the homopolar generator design through the very nature of life itself by a totally automatic process, the attached document falls into the public domain. So this document wasn't supposed to come out, but it did. This is Adam Trombley's device, similar to the end machine, and it had, uh, let's see, I think a 4.92 power gain of the machine. You got out five times more power than you put in but it was taken away. His device was confiscated. He was, he was hassled. He's still around. They didn't kill him off. But we're getting to, beginning to see a pattern emerging here, hopefully, with this, and it will go on. Um, now, let's see. Yeah, I can probably... Uh, yeah, I'm going to play this now. Bedini Motors, another... This is not claimed to be over Unity, but I've got... There's an in, this, this video is in two parts. It's about 10 minutes long. I know I'm playing a, bit, a lot of video clips, but it's a good way to deliver the information. But this Bedini motor has actually been developed into a commercial product called the Renaissance Battery Recharger. But there's another th section to this video which isn't the original Bedini motor. It's a, a Bedini motor and a reproduction. So basically a, a, best, a special type of motor where magnets are used in opposition. You have a north pole pointing at a north pole rather than a conventional motor where you go north-south. And it captures a radiant pulse. 
because as the system operates, it also captures and delivers usable energy. If we had a little trigger signal from this battery over here, and that starts the motor, which we're going to do right now. And if you come around to this side over here, you can see over here, we'll slow it down a little bit. Over here, it's magnetically triggered on this side. Come over here. So each time one of these things goes around here, it puts a little tr trigger signal into these coils. And um, once we get the trigger signal in there, then what we can do is we can, each time this triggers, you know, turns on and turns off, we can collect the charges that would normally be wasted. And of course they go into these banks over here, these capacitor banks, and then this is a timing mechanism here, which uh, it's timed to be about once every second and a half or so, and makes contact here after we collect the charges. And then these capacitors here are dumped through this electronic switch here, and you can, you can actually see the dump here. You watch it, and it'll bounce up when it dumps. So if we slow it down a little bit so you can see it. See, it's, it's bouncing around here. Each time that dumps down, the capacitor bank discharges into this battery. So this battery is going up. As this mechanism uh, triggers here, these are coils. Okay, so the first thing that happens is it wants to repel the magnet like you see it doing here. Okay, it's because it's turning. But these are our trifollower wound coils, meaning that they work like a transformer, but it's not exactly a transformer because they're one to one. So the only thing that can go through this transformer is the radiant spike. And the radiant spike is collected in these condensers. And if we put the meter on in here, so you can watch it, you can watch how the spike is collected. You see? Goes up and down because it's charging and discharging. Now watch, we'll switch condensers. And this one will charge slower. See, and you won't see much of a discharge. When we move to this one over here, it charges much faster. When you hit that battery with the radiant energy, the battery takes the energy from the vacuum in the chemical process and converts it to something that's usable at a later time. In other words, it's a triggering mechanism. You have to trigger your circuits to produce a radiant spike, and then the radiant spike, when it hits the chemical action, sucks the energy from the vacuum. And that's what's charging the battery. Breaks it off. After radiant charger charges batteries, it's a little more difficult to charge with a conventional charger. It takes a longer time after that. So there is an alteration that takes place uh, from using this form of energy that takes place in the chemical composition of the cells. You know, and once it's attuned to this way of charging, the battery accepts the radiant charger much faster each time higher power density output each time. So a 33 amp hour battery might look like a 65 amp hour battery. The difference is radiance, one form of energy, EM as we use today, uh, you know, electromotive force energy, isn't capable of charging this sulfated battery because it sees nothing. It sees an infinite resistance, okay? Radiant energy doesn't, being that the energy is like a hundred times or two hundred times what the sulfation process is. Here, you can look at it again. Now it's brighter. See? And it'll keep doing that. The sulfation will come right off the plates. And the battery will become a pretty good battery again. You can see here that there's eight magnets. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They're all North Pole. There is no South Pole. This motor does not switch back and forth. It is, and it's, a, it's an attraction motor. It's not a repulsion motor. So every time that it's attracted in, it fires like a magneto. Then the electronic circuitry decides to fire. But see, it's out of range when it fires. It's at like 23 degrees after. So when it fires this field, the field is big and pulls in the next magnet and it repeats the same process. So we want to do this as quickly as possible. So you see one, one pole here, one pole here, one pole here, one pole here, one pole down here, one pole down here. And we want them all to fire at the same time. So if you look, all the magnets are lined up to fire at the same time in this direction. And then when the motor moves over here, all of them are lined up to fire in this direction. Once we do that, this is what we can do. Then we got a self-pulsing motor with torque. Good day to you. I've decided to use the name for this particular experiment as Daft Man because I must be daft to get involved with this kind of thing in the first place. But after seeing a few videos on YouTube, I, I started to get a bit inquisitive uh, and decided to go on, I'll have a go then. Um, let's see what all this hype is, whether it works or not. So here we go. Um, I've actually got two coils. I don't know if you can actually see that. 22 SWG. 26 SWG and a 28 SWG, 500 turns. That's 500 turns, bipolar. I think that's what you lot refer to it as. On that, on that coil, and the same on that coil. Now, as you can obviously see from what I've, and what I've just said, I've got three tapped turn outputs. One is the actual pulse, one would be the trigger circuit, and one is a generation circuit. But obviously the trigger circuit also generates power as well. Same with that coil there, exactly the same as what I've just described. Uh, underneath, I don't really want to tip it up, but underneath, I don't know if you can actually see that, there's some magnets flying around, it's just tripping um, reed switches. So the uh, the only difference we mind is you've probably seen that capacitor at the back and wondering what that's for. Right, well the first motor, which is the, the, the drive motor, which is what I refer to it as, just so for clarity, actually drives uh, the outputs of those go down into the bridge rectifier here which then goes off and charges that capacitor I should put my fingers too close to that, it's quite high voltage at the moment which then goes into the second trigger circuit which is on that board at the back that triggers that motor so the output of the two generation sides of that motor go into the rectifier charge that capacitor triggers the second circuit, and then I tap the output off the second circuit into the next bridge rectifier, which then charges this battery. This battery has just come off charge this morning, it was um, about, I don't know, I think about 9, 10 volts, and it's now charging, just to show you, that's the reading from that battery, it's now charging, in fact I've got to put some sort of regulator, it's actually overcharging very slightly, it went to 14 volts a few minutes ago. But you can see 1381 there. The supply battery is 1198 solid. And that's the current it's actually using at the moment. So, for some unknown reason, mine keeps speeding up a little bit and slows down a little bit. Uh, I'm assuming it's when the capacitor starts using the, the current. And it, it just seems to do this sometimes. I don't know why, but. Sometimes I've got to look into maybe it's just a bearing that's starting to wear or overheat. It has been running for, oh god, it's probably running for months now, non stop this house. 
Uh, I have actually got a, a little electronic circuit as I normally have on this that um, switches the batteries over. So when this one runs down to about 8 volts, it switches over to the next battery and swaps the charge over at the same time. So it just keeps swapping the battery, flip-flopping if you like, um, and keeps the whole thing running. The problem is, if you let the batteries run too low, and I've noticed this, if I let this battery here run down to about 2 volts, and then put a new fully charged battery on, which is what I normally use a pair at the back there, and I let them charge up, I find that it doesn't charge that battery back up fully. So over a period of time, the whole thing comes to a grinding halt. If I reset the voltage detection for the switch circuit to detect the voltage drop at about 8 volts, and then swap over, the thing will just run for months. I've actually had to stop it in the end because it's just getting on my nerves, it running it back at the shed. So it's actually been running for many months, um, and I've only just finally plugged up courage to put it on YouTube, if you like. So that's a lovely chat from the North Fling that I don't know who he is. The key concept, that, or the key thing in that video, the first one with John Bedini, he was just charging one battery and then taking the battery off and charging another battery and just running the motor off that. That daft man, as he called himself, he'd put in an extra bit of circuit such that the battery that was driving the motor would then be switched to be the battery being charged uh, every so often and when the voltages became the right way. Now that daft man channel, the YouTube channel, no longer exists. Unfortunately, I didn't get in touch with him before it was taken down. So we're going to come back to this thing about YouTube channels being taken down. Um, Okay, we're going to probably run short of time, but um, Stan Meyer's cell as well. This is a, an extremely interesting device, uh, I think was mentioned on Friday, and this is also an electrolytic type of process, and I think uh, it is thought to produce hydrogen, and, and that's what is claimed in this video clip, um, but it may be some other gas, not hydrogen, it just appears to be hydrogen. But the en again, the energy released from burning the gas which the Mayer cell produces is greater than, the, than that which you use in the electrolysis process. That's the thing, and this has been measured. And, and, and Stan Meyer, he got international patents in several countries. He demonstrated it multiple times over. Several people have reproduced this. Well, it was during the oil embargo of the United States. It alarmed me that a little country over in the, in the Far East could actually cripple the United States and realizing that the entire industrial base of the United States and, and the world is based on the supply and the utilization of energy. It became imperative that we must try to bring in an alternate fuel source and do it very quickly. Of course, I thought originally with the right type of funding, uh, we could possibly get it in within six months. But uh, reality shows that the, the 12 to 15 years was more uh, correct in this projection. Back in the 70s, Stan Meyer set out single-handedly to solve America's energy problems. He decided to do it using water, the world's most abundant storehouse of hydrogen, which is a far more powerful fuel than oil. For 15 years, Meyer has been fighting to get his inventions taken seriously. Most inventors uh, have to be a loner. You have to be somewhat thick-skinned and don't rely on other people to support you, because they will not. More times than not, uh, an invention is really stolen from the inventors. Even in my prior development of high technology, I've had uh, patents uh, taken from me. I learned from the School of Hard Knocks to be very cautious. Meyer has always stood out against the crowd. He has no formal qualifications as a scientist because he didn't wait to graduate from high school, leaving early to go straight into research at the high-powered Battelle Institute in his native Ohio. Now he works full-time as a private inventor. He's built a device with potentially revolutionary implications. There is nothing startling about a machine that can extract the hydrogen from water. What is highly unusual is that it should do so with ordinary tap water. The conventional method is called electrolysis. Meyer has turned that process on its head. Unlike electrolysis, his device doesn't use up large amounts of electric current, nor does it produce an enormous amount of waste heat. For 20 years, he has been refining a method to fracture water, which produces vast amounts of hydrogen on demand. This is not his latest apparatus. He was unwilling to let us point a camera at that. This is the simple device he used to convince a reluctant patent office 
that his revolutionary concept actually works. Alloy rods, acting as electrodes, are housed in a perspex container that's filled with water. Normal mains voltage is fed in through a transformer, but critically, there is virtually no current consumed, less than half an amp. The result is dramatic. Hydrogen pours off with the flick of a switch. Meyer claims the key is his electronics, which pulses electricity rapidly across the rods at up to 20,000 cycles per second. In a way that's not readily apparent, this process transforms the equation. Whereas in conventional electrolysis, three times as much energy is consumed as is produced in the form of hydrogen fuel, in Mars apparatus, the reverse is true. It appears to produce several hundred percent more energy than it consumes. Stan has something that's characteristic of the people that sound like they've done something to tap zero-point energy. Uh, has high frequency, high voltage, and there's a combination of the two at which something occurs. Uh, with Chenetsky in Russia, it was what he called a self-sustaining discharge. The tube would run by itself. When Stan gets this effect, the amount of hydrogen and oxygen that are, are emitted off these two electrodes is a step function. It almost boils the water. If I did this with standard electrochemicals, I need current, and the water should rise a degree every couple of seconds. With stands, it'll run for a half hour, and, you, and the water temperature hasn't changed. Something's different. Maya demonstrates this repeatedly without any difficulty, and yet on the face of it, it represents an extraordinary revolution. His measurements over the years suggest 1,700% greater efficiency than conventional electrolysis. And if he's to be believed, he's getting much better results from his latest, still secret invention. Well, I first got involved with Stan Mai when I went over there with a couple of colleagues to, to look at his water splitting device. And so we arrived at Stanley Mayer. He had a demonstration cell. We filled it with tap water. In fact, I did that myself. And he switched it on, and almost instantly there were three jaws dropped because of the, the, the rate at which the gas poured off. It was quite spectacular. Whatever energy source Stan Meyer had tapped, it was not explicable by the electric power that was going into it. So something was powering it outside of conventional wisdom. There is no question that the gas coming off in such abundance is hydrogen. Meyer ignites it to produce a high temperature flame able to cut through metal. Stanley Meyer has faced a lot of difficulties. Uh, He's three times tried to launch the device and produce press conferences, had the technical press round, but he's been almost universally slated. In the early days, very much so. They just ridiculed the whole idea. He's getting a little more notice now because some scientists are getting interested. But by and large, science is very intolerant, particularly modern science. As with Tesla, Griggs and others, Meyer's claims are so far outside the received scientific wisdom that they've been ignored by the majority of the scientific establishment. But then, Meyer has ignored them too. He has poured his energies over the last ten years into establishing recognition for his claims by getting international patents. In the processing, there was a great deal of difficulty in trying to process uh, the legal paperwork in such a way as to allow the patent office to fully understand uh, what was actually occurring. In one instant, uh, we brought the water fuel cell uh, to Washington, D.C., and of course I had tweaked it in such a way to produce an enormous amount of hydrogen and oxygen gas, and the patent examiner said, no, it will not work uh, based on the electrolysis process, and uh, when we turned it on and produced an enormous amount of hydrogen and gas, uh, the examiner finally realized that we were doing exactly that, and uh, went out in the hallway and started screaming and hollering to everybody on the floor, put out all your cigarettes, hydrogen, hydrogen in the building. So we started laughing and said, well, we certainly convinced everybody in the patent office that we can do what we said we can do. Even so, the U.S. Patent Office dragged their feet for three years before granting patents on the hydrogen-producing device. Since then, against massive resistance, he's managed to get patents established throughout Europe and Japan. But the hydrogen machine was only the first step towards Mars' ultimate dream. If he gets it right, this application of his technology 
would change the 21st century in the same way that the Wright brothers and Carl Benz transformed the 20th. He is currently modifying a beach buggy to run on nothing but water. It doesn't have a petrol tank or even a hydrogen container. It has just a tank of water. He's invented a device called a water splitter to replace the spark plug. As the water is injected into the engine, Meyer claims it's fractured into hydrogen and oxygen and then burned as fuel. Meyer is working on a kit to modify any engine. He hopes to demonstrate it on this car within 12 months. And of course the blessing to the use of the water as a fuel source uh, that on combustion the byproduct is water mist. So we're even solving the environmental pollution problem at the same time that we're using water to maintain the industrial basis of the world. Maher is protective about his inventions to the point of self-confessed paranoia. Most observers describe him as a crank and his car as an aberration. If only a fraction of what Maher claims for his technology can be achieved, it would represent a vindication for NASA's involvement. It would also be a powerful threat to many entrenched vested interests. If Stan Meyer's device works like he advertises, you would make energy available universally almost free. That is a major, major, major impact. When new technology comes in existence, there's a great uh, resistance to it uh, because it can affect a lot of economic factors. Uh, in this particular case in the United States, um, we pay out roughly about $200 billion a year for foreign oil. Uh, it's quite obvious that uh, the Arabs would pay $200 billion to try to keep this type of technology uh, out of the economy. And many, many times over the last decade, uh, I have been offered enormous amounts of money to simply to sell out or to sit on it. The Arabs offer me well over a billion dollars cold cash simply to sit on and do absolutely nothing with it. My life has been uh, threatened uh, many times. Uh, of course, I happen to believe in the power of angels. And if I don't believe in the power of angels, I don't believe I'll be around here too long. Now, um, we're going to go on more onto the cover-up. I've been sort of getting into the cover-up in some of these clips. Why, oh why, would anyone want to cover up cheap energy sources? How can it be covered up? Surely it's a tin foil hat, crazy nutty, conspiracy whack job, conspiracy theory, is it not? I don't think so. The energy industry is probably the biggest global industry of all. Oil, gas and coal mining prospecting are huge, expensive operations. The vested interests are enormous. Everyone needs energy. Even governments of the world need energy and the military need energy. Even medium to large scale use of more conventional technologies, such as the basic electric car running on conventional battery technology, seem to have been terminated as early as possible. And if you watch the film Who Killed the Electric Car, you'll see that story laid out in 50 minutes. That's available on YouTube. Uh, the other video with John Bockris and so on is called Fire From Water. That's 50 minutes as well. Fire From Water, the one that John Bockris was in earlier on. And the narrator was uh, Jimmy Doohan, James Doohan, Scotty from Star Trek. It's a very worthwhile 50 minutes of your life, that watching that video, Fire From Water. Very worthwhile. So what did, I, what did Yuji Malov uh, think about this? The academic... Uh, government complex, not not the the military industrial complex, as much as the academic government complex, is against new scientific ideas that threaten the foundations of their uh, work. And they, no matter how many papers are published, I don't care whether they're on the internet or not on the internet or what they where they are, the establishment uh, academic government complex is brain dead. I mean, why can't they open their arms and say, this is exciting, let's try it, let's experiment, and let's jump in it? it, it well, it's, it's remarkable. I've, uh, I must tell you, George, 15 years, almost 15 years now, after that fateful day of March 23rd, uh, 1989, uh, it conti I continue to evolve in my understanding of the... Uh, well, the, the emotional and psychological and intellectual armoring, uh, to borrow a term from the famous Wilhelm Reich, um, uh, that 
that scientists have. Uh, it's astounding. Uh, 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 one physicist uh, at MIT, whose name is Dr. Uh, Hermann Feschbach, one of the world's foremost uh, nuclear uh, physics people, uh, now he's uh, deceased, but at MIT, as I was finishing up my, my time there as a senior person in the uh, MIT news office as a science journalist, um, he had played a role in, in getting rid of a, a major article that was going, of mine that was going to appear in the MIT magazine, a very influential magazine called Technology Review. It's on newsstands all over the place. He said to me, I've had 50 years of experience in nuclear physics, and I know what's possible and what's not possible. And then uh, that was it. That was his total statement, which I would cite uh, forever yeah. as a a statement, a kind of statement that should never come out of the mouth of any person who considers themselves or a legitimate scientist. They're not a scientist if they say, based on previous knowledge and theory that I have, I know for all time what is possible and what's not. That's obviously crazy. So this goes back to the scientific community just not wanting to accept free, the idea of free energy because they're so sure it can't be real. And that's what Mal have experienced. It doesn't matter about what the data shows. It can't be real. Now, another of the people that was uh, meant to be coming to this conference was Tom Vallone, Dr. Tom Vallone. And he worked at the U.S. Patent Office, and in a 2001 email to Gary Vesperman, he has stated, as a former patent examiner, I can tell you that the number of securitized patents in the vault of the Patent Office, Part 5 building, is closer to 4,000 or more. They never receive a patent number, and the inventor is rarely, if ever, compensated by the government for the use of the invention. The U.S. Patent Office has a nine-member committee that screens patents for national security implications. A hidden purpose of this committee is to also screen the energy-related patents which could threaten the power uh, and fossil fuel companies. Ah, so now we begin to see how it starts to work. So if you have a free energy invention, don't get it patented. Hmm, so let's just go back to that Bruce De Palma clip, shall we? The CIA operates through various innocent-looking fronts to find out what people are thinking and what they're inventing. Now, what's more innocent than a benign institute founded on transcendental principles to help new age inventors bring free energy into the world? If free energy technology was not real, these operations would not be needed. And Edgar Mitchell was involved with this. Yes, the same Edgar Mitchell who's the sixth man not to walk on the moon. How is it that the US now has no manned space program and they went to the moon six, and they, six times in, 19, in the 1960s and 70s? But when they launched the, uh, the new moon missions on the 100th anniversary of powered flight in 2004, they said that the next moon trip was going to be 20 years away. And there is now no manned U.S. program. It's a little bit like the, uh, uh, the um, John Searle flying disc, supposed flying disc technology, which was built apparently in the 1970s, but they have no flying disc now. Quite reminiscent of the Apollo program, to me at least. I've shown that clip already. It's a very brief clip. Okay, so what about these transcendental movements? Well, let's have a look, shall we? It's a little bit of background how I came to be in this strange position of being here today in front of this wonderful audience and at this wonderful event that's been organized with such skill and professionalism. It's a very strange thing for me to be here, really. But I, I got involved with this in 2003 when I discovered something called the Disclosure Project, uh, Dr. Greer, Dr. Greer's Steve, um, Disclosure Project, which is basically about the UFO cover-up. And you can read about that on the website, disclosureproject.org. And um, basically, I got involved with that because in 2003, I knew there was a cover-up relating to the UFO stuff. And this, when again, when you get into this field, you have to start to get into this stuff. You have to start looking at the idea of aliens and ETs and flying saucers. 
if you don't really, to me, you've been, you've been dishonest because it's all interrelated. And I think what I'm going to show you essentially proves that. Now, I won't give too much detail about the disclosure project, but Greer got together a lot of witnesses from the military and high up in civilian organizations such as the FAA and so on. And he made a press conference in 2001 at the National Press Conference Club, very prestigious venue, and these witnesses would swear an oath before Congress that they'd, you know, been involved with UFO-related projects in black projects, and they developed certain bits of technology and so on, or they had very significant sightings which were then covered up, such as the J Japan Airlines case, such as Robert Salas's case, um, where he was in, in charge of nuclear missiles and they were shut down when a, an object came over the silo above ground. Um, but then Greer, Stephen Greer in 2001 said, the reason why, and this was the big light bulb for me, the reason why there is a UFO cover-up is not really about the aliens and the ETs, it's about energy. Because when you realize that these craft really are coming here in cer certain times and landing and doing things, and they've been observed and filmed and photographed and physical evidence taken, and that stuff is all there if you want to go and look for it. And yes, there's hoaxes as well, of course, just like there's hoax-free energy devices. When you realize that that is the truth, then you're going to think, well, what do these craft run on? How are they powered? You know, what, what powers them? Is it coal? Is it gas? Is it nuclear fusion? No, it's something else. Something else. They've been able to engineer the underlying fabric of whatever it is that everything else is made of to extract energy. Now, so Greer, this was Greer's point. It's, that was, he made that point in this press conference. And he said, right, I'm going to form Seize Power, S-E-A-S Power dot com. Okay. And that stood for, he said, oh, it's like a little pun. It's a little pun. Space Energy Access Systems Power. And if you went onto that website, it contained an example, for example, an agreement for inventors to sign if they had a device they were working on and they wanted to develop and market it. Because Greer's goal was, he said, yeah, well, what we need to do is get this free energy out to the world. So what we do is we get the investors and we get the inventors together, we make an agreement, we develop a marketing strategy, and ba bum then we get the device out and we've got free energy. Fantastic. And I thought, top man, top man. What a guy. What a brave guy. Fantastic. Let's get on with it. I don't know. I don't know the date. It was September 2001. I don't know the exact date, but yes, an interesting date for sure. However, <clears throat> we move forward to 2007. And then I, was, I still listen to Coast to Coast and all that stuff, you know, and Stephen Greer comes along and he says, oh, yeah, he did a Google video video about an hour long, which I'll show uh, still from in a minute. And he said... I'm going to start Aero 2012, and what it is, is we need to get free energy out to the world, and um, we're going to get inventors together with investors, and you know, you come onto our website, you sign an agreement, we'll get the cash to you, develop a marketing strategy, strategy, and we'll bring it to market. And I thought, do you know what? I think I've heard that somewhere before. So I went, ah, now, web browser, right www.seaspower.com, one pane, www.aero2012, another pane. Let's have a look, shall we? Let's do a blink comparator, which is a technique they use in astronomy for detecting comets. Oh, look, Aero 2012. Why Aero? An overview for inventors and a historical overview for, of over-unity electric generators and other unconventional energy innovations shows that for at least 75 years, blah, blah, blah. Switch to the Seas Power website. Why Seas? An overview for inventors, an historical overview of only electric generators, unconventional energy innovations that shows for at least... Certain from, hmm, looks like the identical text. And in fact, I looked at the website and those two websites are identical. The only thing that had changed was the logo and the colour scheme. All the same agreements, all the same articles, everything the same. Six years, all he'd done was given the website a colour makeover. There was no information about what inventions he'd looked at, what had been successful, what had failed, and so on. And I've written this up. There's an article on my website called Something in the Aero, if you want to get more details on that. So Greer posted a one- or two-hour presentation, 
Uh, and even in this one or two hour presentation, Greer did not mention anything. He could have shown a Bedini motor. He could have talked about some of the things I've talked about, many other things that he'd been involved with. He didn't talk about that. I don't know if this video is still out there. He said that all these inventors he had in the audience were going to come and speak in this video. They didn't speak in that video. I couldn't find another video where they spoke. And there was no one in that video that we heard from that said anything about anything about what happened with C's power. There's no papers being published from it, to my knowledge. Nothing. In six years. And then we get the people like this, Colonel Tom Bearden and the motion... Motionless electric generator. This is another device that you come across. Now, I did... Um, Tom Bearden's a very interesting character. You listen to him, and he, he, he really does appear to know some stuff. Um, and if you listen to some of his lectures and so forth, he, it's, you know, it's, it's difficult to understand, but he, he does appear to know stuff. And uh, this motionless electric generator, which is like a, an arrangement of coils, which, again, he claimed you could get more energy out than you put in. I saw a good critique of this, and it doesn't actually appear to work when you actually break it all down. Uh, but the critique was very good. I wish I'd saved it because I couldn't find it again. But again, that's one of these devices. It looks as if it has potential, but it doesn't actually appear to work. But why I'm mentioning this is that Tom Bearden made a presentation entitled Scalar Technology and Weather Modification in 1985. 1985. All right? And he showed this slide at the bottom. It's not very clear here, but he talked about interfering beams of energy. Interfering beams of energy. And I'm thinking, hang on. This is what John Hutchison is doing. This is what happened with the World Trade Center with Hurricane Owen providing the static field and the apparent microwaving of the, the um, people in the towers to energy sources and the variations in the Earth's magnetic field indicating there was something going on with the magnetic field. That's exactly, exactly what Bearden was describing, or maybe not exactly, but something very similar. Something very similar. So you can watch that video, uh, Scalar Technology and Weather Mod Modification, I think it's called, 1985, Tom Bearden. Somebody's reposted it. And he talks about Russia having this technology. He said it was the Russians were modifying the weather at that time. But... If you go and read his 2005 book, Oblivion, he supports the official story of 9-11 and says Al-Qaeda did it. Tom Bearden, smart guy. He will not talk about Hurricane Erin on 9-11. He will not talk about the destruction of the World Trade Center. Oh, yes. I used to have a channel called ADJ UK. That was just the name that I used. I had about 270 videos on there, which I started in soon after YouTube started. Posted over a period of about five years. Now, all that content you can't, I can't get because my channel was made inaccessible thanks to two copyright violations by, filed by Energetic Productions, LLC. All right? One of which was filed for a Bedini Motors video that I put on. And the second one was filed when I put a seven-minute clip from that video about Soviet weather modification from 1985. This energetic productions filed a copyright violation against my channel. I'd previously had one for a BBC clip, and with YouTube, it's three strikes and you're out. Uh, so I'd had one from about 2006 or something from some clip I'd posted. Some did, and I'd, I'd taken that clip off. But if you take the clip off, it doesn't stop your copyright violation. So I tattoo from Energetic Productions LLC, one about the Bedini Motors clip, which I've previously shown you, and um, one about this Bearden clip. And I found out that uh, Energetic Productions LLC is the, web, is the company which backs Chenier.org, which is Tom Bearden's website, and it sells the DVDs about Tom Bearden's research. And this is run by a chap called uh, Tony Craddock. And I, so I found three email addresses for Tony Craddock and his company, and I emailed him saying, look, I'm sorry you got upset about me posting that 10-minute clip from your 20-year-old video which is about the, you know, I think is relevant to how the World Trade Center is destroyed. But if I, you know, if you give me back, if you withdraw your copyright violation, uh, I'll delete that clip for you and hopefully I can get my other 270 videos back. And I sent him three emails to different addresses, never heard a thing from him, never heard a thing. And this, is, this guy works with Greer. And guess what? 
Craddock.biz states that he is founder, president, and CEO of Anthony uh, Tony Craddock, and he has, um, he has 40 years' experience in the international petroleum industry. Yet yeah, he's marketing these DVDs about Bedini Motors and Tom Bearden, and he wouldn't let me have my little, tiny, little YouTube channel back. Oh, yeah, but, you know, it just, it's just a question of uploading them all. So let's look, look at the deaths related to free energy research, shall we? Wilhelm Reich, November the 3rd, 1957, found, I'm not sure, I might have got this wrong, I think I might need to change this slide. He was found dead in his prison cell. He was put into prison for contempt of court over the work with the organ accumulators. Bruce De Palma, dead in 1997. Stan Meyer, dead March 21st, 1998. Dr. Eugene Malov, Murdered 17th of May 2004, that was about three months after that audio clip that I played on From Coast to Coast, that was recorded in February 2004. Apparently in a burglary which got discovered, apparently it was his parents' house sorting out um, for changing over of tenants, and he was, there was a burglary and he was, Malov was uh, beaten to death. James Black was also, uh, for, he was um, a Nobel laureate in 1988 for medicine, he attempted to sue the U.S. Canadian government over their actions against John Hutchison's research, and he was found on his bed in his apartment. The autopsy described it as a natural death, a possible heart attack. At the time of his death, he was 51 years old. He was born on the 21st of November 1951 in perfect health. He had never had any heart problems. Ari M. de Gaius, he was dead on November the 11th, 2007, inventor of a revolutionary self-powering battery, of AMDG Scientific Corps was fined, slumped in his car, totally unresponsive in the long-term parking of uh, the Charlotte Airport, I think that is. And here we have another tragic uh, link to what uh, has been going on here. Uh, Dr. Eugene Malov worked with another chap called William Zabur on the New Energy Research Foundation. And William Zabur had uh, a nephew, uh, and his name was Michael Zabur. And he was murdered in a mugging um, on March the 19th, 2006. And Michael Zabur was Dr. Judy Wood's student. And they were putting together information about 9-11. A little more on the death of Bruce De Palma. Uh, De Palma's death in New Zealand in October 1997 put an end to his most ambitious free energy project and occurred only weeks prior to the official testing of a device constructed during six months in the Auckland workshop. This test was attended by, among others, the project's financial backer, Bruce Bornholt, a prominent Wellington barrister as well as the pioneering developer of the Adams Motor. Robert Adams, now deceased, who observed the operation of and measured electrical output from the end machine. The test demonstrated no overunity potential of the end machine. And most of the output was lost as heat and the project was abandoned. Careful if you're moving past the projector, please. Stan Meyer's death. After more than 20 years of research and tinkering, Stanley Allen Meyer and his brother and two Belgian investors raised glasses in Grove City, Cracker Barrel on 20, uh, March 20th, 1998. Um, he took a sip of cranberry juice, then he grabbed his neck, bolted out of the door, dropped to his knees, vomited violently. I ran outside and asked him, what's wrong? Stephen called, this is his brother. He said, they poisoned me. And that was his dying declaration. Um, so again, it ended. Uh, his, his, his research never went forward from that, for that, from that point. If Stephen Meyer was shocked by his twin brother's collapse and, de and death, he was equally amazed at the Belgian response to the next day. These were the people that were me meant to be these investors. I told them that Stan had died and they never said a word. He recalled absolutely nothing. He, he, uh, no condolences, no questions. I never, ever had a trust of those two men ever again. Obviously not. So how do we get access to free energy devices? Well... This YouTube posting, I think, I uh, found some comment on YouTube. This was a pretty good summary. I like summaries. Stan Meyer and many others, always the same story. 
The Pentagon wants to see your idea and tell you how they would like to use your invention. You demonstrate your device, proving to them that it works, which is what a lot of these people have done. They then block all your efforts and end up killing you. The only way to get a free energy device is to forget about patents, distrib distribute it underground, sell it to EV enthusiasts with plans and encourage them to travel around and do as you are, and then you have created a non-interlinked underground distribution system that will spread to the general populace and it will spread like wildfire. It will be unstoppable. So we've got to do this thing underground. So you, we need people with these skills to be, build machinery. But it's one thing to build a device, but then to engineer it into a, you know, a system that will run 24-7. That's a, that's a different issue. And as I see it, the problem is that if you want to get to something that you can keep making big quantities, you need a factory. To have a factory, you need money to build the factory. And then once you get, out, get, get investment in that, you then attract attention to your project. You know, you've got to get through health and safety regulations. You've got to get through tax you know, regulations. So the authorities will get to know about what you're doing. And that's when they shut you down. That's when they either, they'll either send in the lawyers or they'll freeze all your bank accounts somehow or they'll come out with some dirt and stop you earning a living, whatever they can do. And if those things don't work, they'll kill you. That's, that's the situation that we're in. But the biggest thing which the free energy movement won't talk about, and I'll prove that it won't talk about, is this, which you saw yesterday and Friday. Just a very th quick two or three slides. This is a new technology at work. This is energy technology which the people that Eisenhower was referring to, the secret group, whoever they are, they know about this. Where did the buildings go? They were turned to dust in 20 seconds. 10 seconds each, less than that. I'm not going to go through all of this, of course. No appreciable heat. Stan Meyer's cell, no appreciable heat. Cold fusion, very little heat. Unburned paper. What technology can do this? What kind of destruction can, do, can happen like this with no appreciable heat? NIST produced 10,000 pages of technical reports about the destruction of the World Trade Center, right? Two companies that were involved in the production of those reports are Science Applications International Corporation and Applied Research Associates. They do research and development in, guess what, directed energy weapons, yet they helped write the NIST reports. You can go on again research that further. Stephen Greer knows about SAIC. If you read his book on disclosure, I think two of the witnesses that he interviewed mentioned SAIC as a big benefactor of the black budget. Nobody knew it, know where this money, millions of dollars were given to SAIC. Millions of dollars. Bobby Ray Inman, who, talk, who, was it, who uh, Greer talks about, was the director of SAIC. And these I haven't got time to play the audio clip because we're nearly out of time. Uh, last year in Amsterdam, Richard Hoagland presented Dr. Judy Wood's research for an hour and a half in his presentation. Um, and I won't, don't want to read all the text out because we're running out of time, but basically he got a lot of things wrong. He never contacted Dr. Judy Wood before the presentation. He used a picture from one of my booklets that I've created Never even contacted me. I don't mind him using the picture, but he never contacted me to ask me about it. Uh, this was the slide that he used from uh, something that's on my website. Um, but in uh, 2008, Richard Hoagland was talking about the revolution in solar power, and he said, um, what was the biggest single reason why Bin Laden ostensibly killed 3,000 Americans? And he said that, Richard Hoagland did, in 2008. Yet, la yet last year he spent an hour, an hour and a half talking about Dr. Judy Wood's research and getting very important details wrong, by the way. I've written a whole article about that, and it's in my book, 9-11, Finding the Truth. There was 
I won't play the audio clips, we're running out of time. I've, I've got the audio clips to prove that this is what he actually said and I'm not just making it up. So Judy's question, which is exquisitely logical, this is from Hoagland, where did th these things go? So far, she hasn't got an answer. Hoagland was claiming that Dr. Judy didn't have an answer to these questions. That's what he claimed in his presentation in Amsterdam last year. Here's the mystery of the melted steel, he says. There was no melted steel. Now, back to my own experiences. This is me and a few other people you might recognize. David Griffin, Richard Dolan, myself, Lloyd Pye, Nick Pope, Andy and Crane. Nick Pope parrots the official story of 9-11, 100%. Richard Dolan, I met him in that picture, obviously, discussed in some detail Dr. Judy Wood's research, including Hurricane Aaron and the Hutchison effect. Richard Dolan has written about black technology, black projects, breakaway civilization. And in September 2009, during a 77-minute podcast, he discussed 9-11 but only referred to a peer-reviewed paper about nanothermite. And this was uh, three months after I'd met him and put personally in his hand the information about Hurricane Erin. And I think I'd probably mentioned to, to him these things about science applications and international cooperation. In this 77-minute broadcast, he never even mentioned that he'd met me. He met, never mentioned the hurricane. He never mentioned John Hutchison. He never mentioned energy. All he said was that nanothermite can... It's totally integrated with itself, and that's what was used to destroy the towers, according to this uh, paper that had been done by these physicists. And again, I've written about that paper as well, that he refers to. Um, yeah, so I've got all that text. That's a text from what he actually said, and I've got the audio clip, but we're nearly up to time now. We're nearly up to time. Um, yeah, so... Various things that he said. Again, he got them wrong. Um, but would you need this one? Uh okay, so I've got various audio clips. Right, so I just want to finish up with this. We're hostages to the technology which destroyed the World Trade Center. What we see when we, you know, this is from the UK. We've reduced our fuel emissions. That's a lorry load off your mind. They've made it streamlined. This is Marks and Spencer's. This is what we get. This is what we get, this rubbish about climate change, and it's all a scam. Cancer, it's a scam. Energy, it's a scam. All of it, it's all a scam. They create a mindset by putting all this rubbish out in the media and creating these mindsets that, that, that we're then imprisoned in. Let me take this one, folks. Our projections show that by the year 2025, not only America, but the entire planet will be under the protection and the dominion of this power alliance. The gains have been substantial, both for ourselves and for you, the human power elite. <laughs> You have given us entree to the resources we need in our ongoing quest for multidimensional expansion. And in return, the per capita income of each of you here tonight has grown. And this year alone, 
by an average 39 percent. And I've just received word that our forces have won a major victory. The underground terrorist network has been destroyed here on the West Coast. We are off crisis alert. The situation is normal again. How you doing, boys? I didn't know you'd been recruited. Welcome aboard. Earth is our stepping stone for a You know, you boys really should have dressed for the party, now you can afford it. I gotta tell you, I sure am proud to be here. You seen the whole place? I haven't had a chance to yet. Come on, I'll show you around. You know, I knew me and you had a lot in common. First time we met. Money isn't the nicest thing in life. Hey, waiter. Thank you, buddy. Excuse me. Where the hell are we? Backstage at the show, boys. I'll admit it is a little funky, but it serves its purpose. How'd you get here? Use one of these little portable jobs? <laughs> I know we ain't supposed to use them except in cases of emergency, but they're so much fun. <laughs> now, you think that's something? Take a look at this. Go on, take a closer look. Attention commuters, flight Alpha 7 to Andromeda is now ready for boarding. Please step to the transmission platform. That's where we come from. All carry-on luggage must be held securely. Thank you for waiting, and we hope you have a pleasant trip. It has to do with some sort of gravitational lens deal, uh, bending a light or some damn thing. But you can move from place to place, world to world, if you want to. You see, the whole thing, it works like one big airport. Boys, let me tell you, they got their act together. Believe you me. They've got their act together, believe you me. There is some group stopping us from having free energy. We need to be aware of that. I don't know who they are, he's given various names, but this is very important that we're aware of it and we map them out if we want to move this forward. This is something that people don't talk about a lot. And Eisenhower, as I started off the presentation, he knew this, he knew this 50 years ago. So that's, there's some websites there, but I'd just really like to, close with saying thank you so much for listening and as a I'd like to I'll take questions probably you know privately one-to-one -one because we've run out of time but I'd like to quote John Lear because I like what he says he says that if you can learn to live and live without envy hate or greed and love your family then if you move forward with those thoughts when well, we might get somewhere thank you very much indeed <laughs>